Hello and welcome to session two. This will be a health system panel discussion and the topic is cybersecurity insights from the front lines. I'm your moderator, Scott Schindeldecker. I've been with Becton Dickinson for over 20 years in various roles in R&D and um, project management and program management. Now I'm the chief uh, product security officer for BD. So I just wanna go over a few of our housekeeping items before we begin. Please feel free to submit any questions through the chat box. Uh, we have time reserved at the end uh, for the program to address any questions. Uh, the presentation is being recorded for educational purposes and the replay will be available on bd.com slash BD Institute within the next couple of weeks. Uh, finally, after the webinar, we would uh, like you all to uh, participate in a brief five question survey. Um, we'd appreciate your feedback on the session. This is our disclosure uh, slide. Uh, we have no um, conflicts to report. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed panelists. Uh, Eric Decker is Assistant Vice President, Chief Information Security Officer at Intermountain Health. And William Landry is Vice President Technology Innovation at Franciscan Missionaries of Our Lady Health uh, System. And Anel Reckick is our senior director here at BD for information security engineering. And uh, with that, I, I'd just like to ask the panelists, um, we'll start with Eric, just a, a brief introduction. Sure, thanks Scott. And uh, really appreciate being on this panel today to talk about med device and, and the front lines and the challenges that we have. Um, as, as mentioned, I'm uh, Eric Decker, the CISO for Intermountain Healthcare. I actually joined uh, Intermountain uh, about seven months ago now. So prior to that, I was the CISO for about seven years at the University of Chicago Medicine. Uh, I'm also the co-lead for the HHS 405D program, which is a fun little phrase of acronyms and numbers. So I'm sure that means a lot, <laughs> but it is a uh, public-private partnership and uh, in partnership with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services on aligning and, and bringing cybersecurity practices forward to the healthcare industry. And it was a requirement under the Cybersecurity Act of 2015. The reason why section 405 is, is called now is because it was uh, that section of the law. So I, I uh, am afforded the honor of, of being the industry lead for that. I have a, a government partner and counterpart. And we uh, our first inaugural product was Take up the health industry cybersecurity practices document. Great, great. Um, Bill? Hey, my name is Will Landry. I'm the Vice President of Technology Innovation for FMLHS. Um, we are a um, multi hospital system. We have um, uh, 12 hospitals in the Louisiana and Mississippi markets. Um, and um, I've been with um, with the health system for two years. Prior to that, um, I've been in the healthcare enterprise space. Uh, for about uh, almost 10 years now in um, with a uh, large healthcare and hospice organization and also with a, a payer organization as well. So I've kind of been around the, the different areas. I'm responsible for um, all of our cybersecurity um, strategy and also for our technology strategy. So I've, uh, I come from a little uh, little different angle on some of these topics. Nice, thank you. Thank you, and Enel? So I'm in Harry Keek. I'm Senior Director of Information Security Engineering at BD. Uh, I oversee all security engineering efforts for manufacturing, uh, IT, and OT. Uh, and uh, prior to BD, I was in healthcare delivery organization for my entire career. Um, my most recent role was director of health technology security at MedStar Health, where I built the uh, security program for medical devices and medical IoT. I'm also uh, part of the, within, um, actively engaged in the industry uh, and leading the Nest technology landscape and, and uh, making sure that security is baked in. And uh, I'm, I'm the co-lead of the 5G MDIC working group, which is whose mission is to incorporate, um, uh, to facilitate the adoption of 5G technologies in the medical space, along with another MDIC uh, penetration testing working group. So, um, and then also HSAC. Um, so um, I, uh, I'm engaged in multiple groups, but um, pleasure to be here. Thank you. Great, what a, what a panel, we, we've got everything covered here. So just for the audience, um, the, the discussion today 
uh, will focus on what health systems are doing to keep their networks, their devices, their patients, and, and their data secure amid today's changing cybersecurity landscape. Uh, we'll cover emerging uh, cybersecurity concerns, risks associated with maintaining legacy devices and operating systems, and guidance for prioritizing uh, your organization's cybersecurity initiatives. And with that, I want to start with this first uh, question, and uh, that would be cyber attacks against our nation's critical infrastructure are on the rise, including attacks against healthcare. What concerns you most about this trend or the types of attacks you're hearing about? And we'll start with you, Will. I think that's a great question. Um, you know, over the last last couple of years, I think what we're seeing is, I mean, there's obviously bad actors that just want to cause harm, but the, the bigger concern or the threat is the is, is there is the monetization of ransomware, the monetization of the hack. So what they're trying to, you know, what they're really trying to do is is get ran, is, is for ransom payments. And from a data perspective, you know, we've for the most part secured data. We've got backups of data. And in many cases, if we were to get crypto lockers, we could just destroy the data and restore it. The problem, or I guess our real concern is when it comes to medical device hacking or medical device ransomware, where where there's a life at stake, we're going to pay the money. And so that's where um, that's where our real concern is going forward is in making sure that, you know, obviously that's the topic of today's conversation is making sure that our devices that are attached to our patients in one way, shape or another are protected and are, um, you know, from against these attacks. So that's where our, our, our concerns are going forward. Great. Yep. Great. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, I'll add to that. I mean, uh, Will's absolutely correct. You know, I think w when I consider the last couple of years and the trend of the threat actor, um, the level of sophistication has gone up tremendously. And the the amount of money in the underground markets is has gone up significantly. You know, so if, if you're not aware, it's not like uh, it, we're not in this in this stage anymore where it's a single attacker or a single group of attackers that are coming at an organization um, and trying to make their mark. There's actually an economy of supply and demand. There's an economy of the attackers breaking into an environment and getting access and selling access on the deep web to other people who are interested in causing an impact, testing that access, confirming the validity, the validity, sorry, of that of that access. Um, and, you know, and handing that off to ransomers and ransomers and, you know, using that as a means of breaking in and, and uh, or sorry, of, of causing the impact of the damage that they're, that they're doing. <clears throat> and then there's, there's, there's plenty of, there's <laughs> lots of other, you know, sort of uh, structures in that underground economy that's, that's in place. So when, when I think about that, um, you know, I, obviously the attackers know all the things that we know, you know, that phishing is, is highly, a highly used vector and nothing new there. Um, but they also know that, you know, as, as we've seen in the last year, especially in the last fall with the solar winds attack, and then later this spring with Casilla, um, you know, where they're throwing malware into supply chain and into validating code of the supply chain. They're breaking into security companies and using the leverage of the security companies themselves, whose, whose business model it is to secure organizations, mm -hmm. uh, that's highly alarming. You know? And so when I think about this and, and I think about what's happened in the last 12 months, you know, I think that's definitely a pivot. We've always known that the third party is, is a challenge. You know, we, we all have third party risk programs and, and things to vet that. I like to think of you know, that third party risk program, you know, there's really three contexts that we have to consider and, and it's time for us all to sort of mature out of uh, just the data centric view. You know, it's historically we've thought about it as where's our data at? How have we handed that off to the third party? What are they doing to secure it? That's important. It's very important. Um, but we need to add in as well, you know, how critical is that third party to our mission and our mission of, of care um, and understanding that from a business continuity perspective, very, very key. And then the other, the third element is access. And this is going to come into the MDMs as well. Uh, so what is the conduit of access that those third parties have to our environments within the healthcare delivery organization? Because, you know, as we build up our barriers, as we protect against phishing, as we get our perimeter locked down, as we, you know, get better at patching and all that, they're still going to be looking for angles in. And our angle in now is the, that connection that we have. 
Right. Um, and it's very common in the MDM space where there's, you know, there's connectivity that, that occurs. So I think those are, um, those are elements, you know, of, of trends and, and considerations as we move forward. Excellent. Thank you. And Enel, do you want to add to that? Yeah, so I'll add to what Eric and Will mentioned. So as our technology uh, evolves and we move into the accelerated, we had this accelerated digital transformation, remote work, and we're going into remote care and it's becoming more prevalent. The attack surface has obviously increased. But what I think to Eric's point and to Will's point that uh, ransom, ransomware are on the rise and as much as technology is evolving, bad actors are evolving their service models. So now it's ransomware as a service and, uh, you know, it's uh, it's getting, they're, they're, they're evolving their, their way of, um, you know, um, getting into the environment. And that means that we have to evolve with it, security has to evolve. Uh, and, this, and we'll uh, talk about supply chain uh, later on. I know we have a question uh, to address to, to go more in details with that as well. Right, great. No, great, uh, gr great start here. And um, uh, I'll shift gears slightly though, uh, just to talk a, a little bit about a concern that we, I know that the M MDRF and other uh, reg regulators are looking at is legacy devices. So this question is, what is your biggest challenge for protecting legacy medical devices that no longer support security patches? And I give an example here. So does just isolating the device on a segmented network, eliminating the uh, internet access and firewalling off that product from the hospital business network really go far enough? And um, let's start with uh, Eric. Sure. Um, so, you know, that example of segmentation is important. It's, it's important to have in your strategy, but I, I think I would take a step back in, in all of this as it relates to legacy. And, you know, first is the acknowledgement that we are in a space with medical technology where it's inevitable that we're gonna have to manage this problem. I mean, there's, there's no getting out of that problem. You know, if when we think about the context of, you know, it, what it, the life cycle of development of the products, how long it takes to get through clearance, you know, and, and make sure that they're safe and effective uh, for use within an HDO, to the HDO purchasing them and having their own life cycle for use. Um, and, you know, then you compare that up against, you know, the, uh, the life cycles of like OS development and, you know, Windows and, and, and so mm -hmm. forth. And, you know, these things don't match up perfectly and nor are they gonna match up perfectly. Yeah. And so I think, you know, the, the way I would tackle this is, and, and I recommend everybody tackle this, is at managing it as a program. Um, in that program, you have to consider that eventually that device is going to become legacy and you're going to have to have a bridge period of time on how you're going to manage it as a legacy state, mm -hmm. um, you know, until you can ultimately replace it. You know, but, I, you know, when you think about like the key elements of that program, you know, start from each of the life cycles of, of the, the phase of these devices. So, you know, from procurement and bringing the device in the door, you know, having that tie with supply chain and, you know, making sure that you've got those security reviews, you know, conducted and you're looking at the MDS2s and all of that, you know, and, and contracting and, and making sure you've got the good contract language in place for your relationship with the MDM. That's important you know, to implementation, you know, so as you're, as you're bringing that device in, as you're, as the project is taking it underway to deploy into this, into the space, you got to make sure you're designing the security pursuant to what those MDS2 statements are. You should be looking at as your template and then comparing that against your own standards and, and how that sort of, you know, mixes in. Um, and, you know, and then, implement that into your ecosystem accordingly, which should include, by the way, into a segmented area that's, you know, that's off the beaten path from the rest of your technologies. Once it's in, now you got to move into a monitoring state, you know, so that monitoring state is looking at the hygiene of those devices, the vulnerability status of those devices. This is where, and I'm sure we'll talk about SBOM later, you know, I would definitely be you know, as we move forward with SBOMs, security uh, software bill of materials or cyber bill of materials, if they become a CBOM, I'm not sure which tech we're using right now. We'll but go with, we'll go with that SBOM today. Yeah, we'll go with that SBOM. Yeah. <laughs> to, you know, reoccurring risk assessments and so forth, you, you know, you really need to make sure you have a continual process on this where you're looking at 
how these vulnerabilities and the state of, of hygiene of these devices are actually in place, where they are on the network, make sure that they don't shift and move around. It's very easy, you'd be surprised in it from an HDO perspective, how you think a device is one place, and then you blink and turn sure. turn your head, and then suddenly it moves over here into a different place entirely. You know, so interesting. We need, like, we need real time systems and ways of, of sort of monitoring around that. And there's there are some good technologies that are out there. So, and then as they move, sorry, I'll, I'll just two more quick things. Um, and then as they move into that that end of life cycle, that's that legacy state, right? So you, that's where your risks should come into play, where you should be informing. Um, uh, the, the the device owners on how to replace and how to manage the risk, you know, accordingly. Um, and then all of this, you know, through the whole life cycle, there should be metrics. And I, you know, I, I sort of bring this up all the time, you know, within my own organization, that metrics and continual improvement is the answer to how you manage cyber. You know, you just, it, it's a constant evolution. It's a constant um it's a constant moving forward and making progress. And you can only do that if you are if you can measure where you've been, you know, and, and then move from there. So you should, have a, you should have a metric or a measurement around the life cycle of all of this. Fantastic. As you, as you were talking about the HDO side, I'm thinking, of course, in the, in the medical device manufacturer side, that, that paradigm shift from we're just worried about picking components, the, the hardware components, because that's so expensive, that's there's so much to replacing a component in a device. But the whole paradigm shift now is around the software and the operating system, the third-party components. There is a whole maintenance life cycle of those that has to continuously be fed, monitored, fed, updated, validated, and produced. Um, so we we're both in that in that same um, cycle. It's it's a new awakening of it just never goes away. I mean, until you decide to make and declare and into life. But um, I wanted to ask, um, Anel, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, so I think the IMDRF, um, International Medical Device uh, Regulation Forum, has really decided to attack this really uh, difficult problem because oftentimes the extended, the, the useful life of a device extends its end of life and end of support. And um, so what we need, so the, the harmonization of regulation and meaning that uh, clear communication uh, from a de medical device manufacturer about the end of life of support, end of life of the device and end of support and then if the you know if the uh, if the provider wants to use the device beyond its life cycle and its end of life and end of support then that you know the the uh, the, um, the the uh, the responsibility then handed off to the provider and it's a, it's a complicated problem because i've been on the other side and i've you know, had, you know, devices who've been there 20 years are up and it's very expensive. And I think the, from an HGU perspective, I'm going to put my HGU hat on it for a couple of minutes here, but it's really making sure that you are a business enabler, that you're part of the procurement process and that you're looking into your technology portfolio and you're doing a five-year roadmap. So it's no surprise that in, in five years, that this this is getting obsolete, and uh, I think by by partnering with these uh, stakeholders, you you're really able to proactively address that problem. But as a reactor, as a as a preventive control, or you could um, you know, as Eric mentioned, the the segmentation of the device and uh, making sure that you do a risk assessment that is documented, exception request is documented, and that compensating controls are properly in place, that you're not mixing supported devices with non-supported devices on your network, that you have a way of segmenting uh, that properly, uh, and uh, making sure that these, um, you know, these various group are, manage are doing that because you'd be surprised that sometimes or devices come in, or devices are not segmented. So it's just, um, it, it's it's a, it's a complex problem. I think it's um, one that um, requires uh, that we tackle together. Yeah, great. Um, go ahead, Bill. Did you, did you want to add something too? Yeah, I was just going to add. I think that you know, the isolating of the devices is is a great step. But in in my case, what I've seen, um, you guys have probably seen this too, is that they sometimes get out of sight, out of mind. They get forgotten about when they're isolated, and that can be problematic. Um, one of the things that we've we've recently started doing um, in the last year and a half is we have a compliance committee where we take 
um, when we take these legacy devices. You know, if we ask our if the local operating teams, and we ask them to replace these, it's you know we don't have the budget or we can't do this right now because we didn't plan for this. But if we you know if we take this to our compliance committee where our like health system CFO and CEO sits and ask them to accept the risk, the answer is always no. They will not accept that risk. So that helps drive uh, changing out the um, a lot of these legacy equipment, and it really has helped us move the ball in the last year and a half on a lot of these systems. That's great, great, great advice there. Thanks. Okay, I want to move on to another question here. Um, how does your organization manage the procurement process with regard to meeting the needs of both the organizations and clinical information security folks? So both folks, um, how does your cybersecurity, how does cybersecurity factor into the purchasing decision? And Will, let's uh, let's start with you on this one. Yeah, this is another. We've we started this in uh, probably the last uh, two years. Um, our, we have a very close relationship with our legal team and our materials management team, to where any contracts that go through that um, through our health system, and we've got a pretty really tight controls over who can sign contracts uh, within the health system. Anything has to actually, the, before it even starts the legal process, has to be signed off on by cybersecurity. So we do a formal, vent, you know, a vendor review. And this is even like, even if we bring in a new product from an existing vendor, we still do a, a, a cybersecurity review of that product and what they're doing. So our legal team won't touch a contract unless our cybersecurity or unless our IS Chris team has reviewed and signed off on it. And I think that's really important to build those relationships um, with, with legal and with materials management so that they understand that um, and they understand the risks of, of what's out there and, and to let um, the cybersecurity teams uh, do their job to do those reviews. So th that's, that's one of the a major thing that we've done in place. And then we, we work with them along the line too, and we'll do some stuff in tandem with what they're doing, but we typically want to sign off on, on doing that. We have a formal you know, um, security review process for vendors and products. Great, great. Um, Eric? Yeah, I, I, what, what, what Will said there is, is very similar, uh, you know, to our process. And, you know, what, I, what I'll say is, that relationship with your supply chain and legal is incredibly important. And, you know, if you haven't established that yet, um, definitely uh, that should be on your list of, of things to look at. Um, the, the things that you need to be considerate of, of course, are the the concerns that bringing cyber in is going to slow the process down. And, you know, so you've got always that, you got to manage that relationship uh, appropriately. And you, you have, you know, within a cyber program, we are service we, we deliver services, you know, and we have to be uh, just like everybody else in the organization and, you know, deliver in, a, um, in an appropriate time frame that is, you know, is, is acceptable. So uh, just that's important there. And it, what I would say as well, I'm, I'm going to plug uh, a couple of uh, products here that, that can help organizations along for those listening. Uh, so within the, within Hiccup, the health industry cybersecurity practices, which was developed with the 4-5-D program, um, there's there's 10 practices outlined. And one of those practices, practice nine, is all about medical devices and, and the security of medical devices. And we built into that a procurement uh, arm on how to, you know, uh, how to provide some practice and, and things that you can incorporate. So if, if you haven't seen Hiccup yet, uh, definitely take a look at that and, and go for it. Uh, the other thing I'll, I'll throw into the mix for those NDMs that are on the line is the joint sec the, the joint security plan that was produced by yours only, Rob Suarez, and and others. Uh, you know, BD was a was a great uh, a great leader in this space, and uh, Johnson Johnson was also in this space, and, and some others. And that really helps sort of frame the. Um, I, I'm probably going to not give it the service that it, it, it warrants. Uh, but the framework by which the technology, the medical technology can be built and, and product security managed, as well as getting it up to that procurement and, and sale part. So it's these two things go together real nicely. <clears throat> yeah, great. And the feedback. And it feeds back yeah. again with vulnerability monitoring and such. Thanks for the, uh, for the plug there. That was great. Um, I want to yeah. give Anel a chance to comment on this one as yeah. well. But I haven't seen any questions yet from the audience. So. I, I know Hiccup, I mean, come on, there's got to be have, somebody has to have a question about Hiccup. How did you come up with the acronym? Um, but yeah, in the bottom here, I think there's, uh, or to the side, you can enter questions in and we'll try to get those questions at the end. But uh, go, and now did you want to add to this one yeah. too? 
Well, please go ahead and, and ask your question. I think pretty much uh, Eric and Will covered it. So it's really oh. about being a business enabler and being part of your capital planning and uh, a good way of getting buy-in from uh, legal and others within your organization is perhaps uh, you know, partnering with internal audit, uh, partnering with internal audit and having these findings. And because it does, you, you, you're going to add the pro, you're going to add another step into before you're able to purchase a device, like the security agreement, the security review. Uh, but if it's, uh, if it's an internal audit finding and it's, you know, brings visibility to your senior leadership, then you're able to bake in security into, uh, the, the, the procurement process and, mm -hmm so forth. And I've had uh, in put my HGO hat on, but I um, had uh, tremendous support from executive leadership. And even there were um, times where we decided to go with a more another medical versus another because of the how robust the cyber security program is. So you want to get in a place where cyber is not afterthought that is baked in into all these processes. Great, great insight, thank you. So let's move on to another question here. Um, what's, what is, I'm sorry, what is clinical information security's role in your organization after procurement? And how can uh, medical device manufacturers partner with you for better outcomes uh, from installation through end of service? And uh, let's start. Um, let's start with you, Anel. Yeah. So it's a complex uh, problem, um, medical device security and medical IoT security, because in HGU, they, 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 we're seeing the trend of clinical information security, which is amazing because they know the that there is the medical devices there we're reg, that's a regulated space or it's different type of sets of controls that can be applied and then i think the challenge comes in that with the fact that they have to work with multiple desperate the separate groups uh, so you have clinical engineering managing some type of devices then you have lab managed by lab which they're not very tech savvy so and then you have uh, other cat lab devices that are managed by Cat lab and you the complexity comes in into you can't just push a patch and you know traditional IT security you push a patch and you don't need to say anything you just need to remove your, remote your laptop with medical device security it's very important to build in those relationship with these stakeholders and um, back at MedStar I spend a lot of time on the road talking to these multiple stakeholders, and I think you need to customize the training, but one, one thing that made a difference is whenever there is these vulnerabilities disclosed is to explain in simple terms what that means, what the risk, because they need to take active step into remediating that. And I find that, you know, we didn't need to do that with traditional IT security, but with medical device security, I found that it went, um, an extra length by just explaining at a high level what's the risk of this being exploited so that, you know, um, you, we get these, the mitigation is, is prioritized. Great. Eric, Eric, similar, different, something else? Yeah, so I'm uh, not going to be controversial and disagree, I think. I tried. on target. Um, <laughs> so, I, you know, I think one of the things I'd like to add to this is, you know, when you talk about this kind of goes into what I was talking about with the monitor state, you know, after you procured and implemented and, and what does monitoring look like? You know, so there's there's a lot of real time things that would be ideal if you could have it in place, like bringing your, you know, those key systems from a business continuity and mission criticality perspective, that monitoring into your security operations center so that, you know, uh, what's going on and you're tied in, you know, to the think about it as tied into the bedside because many of these devices are literally tied into the bedside, you know, and, and an outage of minutes is, is actually, in, um, it's important. You know, it could be important if, if you have that. So there's, there's that. Um, uh, and, and of course, just I'll, I'll hit on it again. You know, the, the, the ecosystem is really, I think the, the thing to consider as we're, as we're talking about tech, these technologies you know, several years ago, we were talking about the risk of um, medical devices. This is maybe, I'll go back six, seven years, 
Um, you know, and the, and the big concern was breaking into the device and causing direct harm to a patient. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not suggesting that that's not possible, by the way. I'm just, I'm just, you know, that was as we were just getting our arms around what does it mean for cyber and medical technology and, and the risks associated to that. Um, you know, those of us who watch Homeland, of course, saw season two. I don't want to give any spoilers for those who haven't seen it, but we've had a year and a half of uh, quarantine. So if you haven't seen that, 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 that show yet, you should go watch it. Um, at the end of season two, there's a big thing that happens, you know, with medical technology. And so that was like the thing that everybody was concerned about. Um, I'm not going to downplay that, but I think the the thing that we have to consider is medical technology is part of the ecosystem of our environment. And we know it's weak because of the inherent nature of how it takes to manage these devices. You can't just throw a patch on them uh, and assume that it's gonna fix the issue because that patch could actually cause harm. It, could, might, it might not work properly. It might not be quality checked. It might, you know, you, it could have its own consequences from a patient safety perspective. So you've gotta be, you've gotta have a rigorous and, and robust uh, process in this. Now, if, I'm gonna take us back to WannaCry, if, if of those of us who all remember that, um, and I thought this was a really good intersection of, of time that, that this ecosystem challenge at, at play, you know, whereby, you know, so one cry happens, the UK gets hit very hard. Um, you know, the, the United States had, you know, maybe 24 hours worth of lead time on right. sort of how things were spreading. There's a huge, you know, robust response from the, the healthcare industry Everybody started, you know, going down the route of trying to like close up any issues that they might have, et cetera. Somebody finds the kill switch, thank God, and, you know, initiates the kill switch and, and stops the automated spread of that. But the underlying vulnerability that allowed for WannaCry to be so successful was a bad one. And it, and it allowed for that sort of self-propagating spread. When you tie that in with the medical technology in that, at that time, you know, and when we talked about the risk assessments of medical technology at that time, that the risk assessments weren't classified from an MDM perspective, weren't classifying that as critical risk. And they weren't doing it because it didn't have a direct patient safety implication associated to it. But it absolutely had an ecosystem implication to it. And so I think that that was a really good wake up call for us, you know, to where we understand, like, how does this all fit together? And, you know, understanding that ecosystem risk and then understanding how to manage that at scale is is really the true next step in all of this. Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, Will. Yeah, I'll, I once again have a little bit of different kind of perspective on this coming from more of the technology side. But um, this is something we we are like most systems have traditionally not been good at. Uh, and, and just maybe like a couple of years ago looked at these devices as not IT. You know, they were either they were biomed or clinical engineering devices. That was their responsibility. And they just rode the IT network, right? Well, well that, that's that been a big change for us the last couple of years. And we're still not perfect at it, but we're getting closer and closer to where, you know, we have a um, third-party clinical engineering management team that now reports to our cybersecurity team. We've changed that. They, they basically used to report up through facilities. And we've really changed it to now they report through cybersecurity because there's so much tied in there that they have to, that like like we said, it's once we get the device after the procurement process, it has traditionally just been forgotten about. And now we we need to make sure that it's in that, that device life cycle. The other thing too that we're, we're doing now that we haven't fully implemented yet, but it's on our roadmap and we're working through it actually as of today and we're building this team is creating a clinical infrastructure team because in a lot of times, these when it when these devices have fallen in IT, they've been more on the clinical team, which the clinical team is either focused on Epic or whatever EMR, and is not not device specific. They're not technology or, or hardware specific. And then our local support teams are not medical device knowledgeable. So that's right. been a big gap um, in as far as ownership within the IT um, IT space. And we've 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 created this team that's that's like really focused on medical devices in IT, and we've already seen some 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 really big wins in some small spaces, and we think this is going to grow exponentially over time. Uh, that's going to help us manage manage these devices long term. Fantastic, great, great insight, all. Thank you. Um, now we'll switch gears a little bit more. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis this year 
especially on supply chain security, and we hinted to this a little bit earlier. In your view, what are medical device manufacturers doing well, and what can we do better to empower healthcare delivery organizations to manage the supply chain risks, such as vulnerabilities in third-party software components? And there's the term here is, how are you going to use SBOM? Um, you know what? Let me start with this one. You, you guys asked me, uh, I'm going to ask, I'm going to answer some of this for the medical device uh, manufacturer's side. Um, we, we are uh, implementing SBOM and uh, there's a lot of work that has been done over the years with this. There's working groups on SBOM and, you know, there's a lot, it's not an easy task. Um, knowing what our, uh, that our developers have a handle on what open source um, components they're using and third party components they're using is a very good first step. And I think that's where we are today. I know there's there's more maturity depending on the organizations, but I think today we're happy to know that there's security by design up front at the developer's desktop. And we're um, there's multiple tools out there. Um, some are more complete than others. Um, you may have uh, you may have to look around for these. We, we happen to use a, a product called White Source. Um, I know Microsoft uses this, and in their training, they offer um, around uh, secure DevOps. This is a, a tool that they use in their in their shop, and um, integrating that into your pipeline and making sure that um, developers have this uh, again at their desktop. So it's self kind of self healing, right? They're 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 seeing this right up front as they're selecting components or as they're building, um, they're getting the feedback right away around those components, those open source components. So we hope that that's a benefit. Um, you know, there's a long way to, to launch. So um, a product and keeping the monitoring of those components uh, all the way through that um, build pipeline is very important. But then once we get to the MDS2, as, as you guys uh, alluded to, the MDS2 having a SBOM for, for you all um, to ingest, um, we know that that's, that's a step away, um, but hopefully the combination of security by design and security by in use, we'll, we'll get uh, to where we need to be with, um, with those vulnerabilities. Um, I'll go, um, Eric, do you, any comments on that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think first what I'd like to say is, is, you know, give a shout out to the MBMs who have really stood up and acknowledged the challenge of cyber in this space. Um, acknowledged, you know, that that it's a joint partnership, you know, between the HDOs and the MBMs to actually solve for this. Uh, it has come, you know, my career in, in just being in healthcare, it has come tremendously far from where it was 10 years ago. You know, 10 years ago, it, 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 those of us, you know, those of you who have been on the HDO side, I'm, and well, even on the MBM side, it was a pointing game, you know, it was a blame game. It's, you know, it's your fault. Right. It's your problem. No, it's your problem. And, you know, we weren't getting anywhere, you know, <laughs> with that with that challenge. And, you know, so I think, and, and I'm going to give credit here to the to the leading organizations who who stood up, you know, some publicly like BD, you know, in front of the FDA at, at one of the um, the public conferences, you know, and said, like, we are we are tackling the cybersecurity challenge and we are we are baking in security by design into the product suites. And, you know, this is the path forward and we have our own responsibility and the HDOs who have now also acknowledged, we also have our own responsibility here. You know, we, we implement the devices, we have to manage them and maintain them while they're here in, in Houston in clinical settings. So, you know, that is our, our, uh, our obligation. And then there's also, you know, public private partnerships. So the, there's, um, you know, the healthcare is one of the critical infrastructures and there's a joint cyber working group, uh, under the national, um, um, National Infrastructure Protection Plan uh, that requires actually the new National Defense, uh, the NDAA. I can't remember what that one stands, the AA stands for, but but new laws, you know, that that got enacted that codify some presidential directives previously that says, you know, industry and government have got to come together and you know have a, fr a forum by where we can we can tackle these challenges. And the MDMs have come to the table. This, you know, the JSP, the Joint Security Plan, is an example of that. Um, hiccup is an example of that, you know, where we, we are acknowledging our side, uh, the HGO side of that, of that uh, challenge. Um, under the Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council, where, where this work, this body of work is created, there's new 
products uh, soon to be released, you know, model contract language uh, around mm -hmm. like how to actually, and this is already pre-vetted and debated language that <laughs> NDNs and HDOs came together and actually agreed on what should be in the contract, sort of like a template. So wait, so no red lines, so we're not allowed to do any red, red lines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, take Fantastic. it as you will. Take it as you will. But you know, it's it, it, and I'll tell you, I mean, I, I I wasn't in every single one of those groups, but I was I was in it and and sort of part of the process in its development. And there was really good, robust debate that was happening. Nice. And this is all done sort of on behalf of industry to try to get people over that hurdle and get us into that more proactive approach. So really, really good stuff coming. Um, as it relates to SBOM. Yeah, I think SBOM is an excellent step forward. You know, understanding the componentry of, of the technology is key. Uh, we're going to have the challenge, however, the, the data challenge as, as a result of this. And, and I think of this as kind of like the old vulnerability scanners from 20 years ago, where we, we queried a banner, we looked at a version on a banner, we looked it up in a database, and we inferred, you know, vulnerability. And that's... It's fine. You know, that's that's the state of things. That's That's really... Given the criticality of these devices. You can't just go out there and actively scan and intrude and try to break into them, especially if they're in production settings. So mm -hmm. it's, it is absolutely a step forward. We have to figure out how you operationalize all of that with all that data, with all those versions, with you know automation. Automation is really the only way that that's gonna be successful. Sure. Um, and, and then of course, all the MDMs sort of coming together in that, in that standard format to uh, to be able to speak in the same language with us, Bob, is going to be important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Anel, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the way on how machine readable SBOM is is a good uh, goal to achieve, but also, you know, finding ways on how HGU, the industry, need to can consume consume that data in a proact in a productive way because you can just enter that. Well, I mean, it's already how do you how do you make use of that data? Um, I think from a medical device manufacturer is, is part of your robust application security program and the, all the things you mentioned. But from HGU, I'd like to see the industry thinking about um, how can HGU leverage, you know, the SBOM data and how can they store it um, into their systems? Yeah, yeah, great. Thanks. Will, do you have anything you want I to don't add? I don't have anything to add that it is any better than anything you guys have already offered. So, <laughs> <laughs> great, great, thank you, thank you. Okay, so as we look ahead, what trends do you expect in healthcare cybersecurity? What will our biggest concerns be six months from now or a year from now? And will let's uh, we'll start with you. I think yeah, thanks. I, you know, as we mentioned at the beginning, I think the the trend of of, of going after or the monetization of, of the attack, right? Going after things that we can't just destroy and restore, um, like devices connected to humans or you know connected to patients, and and then also like what what Eric mentioned earlier, going after the, the our security supply chain or going after what we hold to be. Um, what we trust now, right? And, and breaking some of those trusts, you know, whether, I mean, that could be Microsoft or someone else that they go after uh, and some of those, the, the, and that's that's where the real concern is. Um, mm -hmm. And also too, uh, I'll say this, we haven't really talked about this at all, and uh, but also just the, the um, you know, as our cybersecurity teams are growing, our ability to bring in talent is, um, is also yeah. very challenging over the next six to 12 yeah. months. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, indeed, indeed. Um, Eric? So I think it, what's going to be interesting, I'm going to take a, a different spin on this question. Um, what's going to be interesting is to see how the geopolitical nature of this plays itself out. So just recently, you know, the Biden administration has been pushing on um, other countries to stop ransomware and, you know, and, and stop supporting ransom groups, I should say. Um, you know, there are, there are certain countries that sort of provide a, I wouldn't say they uh, they support it, but they don't actively dissupport it, you know, <laughs> is maybe the, the way to think about it. Uh, while it, as long as it doesn't happen against their own country, that's sort of the position statement that has, that has been made. So um, I think those geopolitical pressures will be interesting and hopefully uh, will help this problem because right now it's a bit, you know, run amok. Um, the, the other thing that's going to be interesting is, is how the, how law enforcement's uh, 
tackles the crypto, the, the financial side of this, the financial transaction side of this. So the Bitcoins and uh, digital distributed ledgers and such, you know, using those digital tech currencies as the means of financing the ransom campaigns, they're trying, they're going at that as the, as the, to try to disrupt the, the actual revenue stream, as it were, you know, for the bad actors. Mm -hmm. So if, if progress is made there, I, I hope, being optimistic, that that will cause a significant disruption in these bad actors causing these these damages. Uh, but you know we got we have to continue to operate as if that won't you know progress won't be made there, and so we've got to continue to shore up our own defenses and and capabilities. Great, um, and now. So as we look ahead, um, I think I would like to see, uh, I see more, you know, medical device manufacturers. I'm, I'm very proud of being part of medical device manufacturer that value uh, trust and transparency and collaboration. And we have um, published our trust center, but I see more back when I was in HGU, there wasn't many coordinated vulnerability disclosure down on medical devices. So I do see that trend in, in becoming um, something that you know become that most medical device manufacturer would do and just part of you know routine of you know software aging and maintaining the device throughout the the life cycle so that's Great. where i would to see in terms of uh in terms of attacks and uh see that that one of the things that we need to keep in mind, and Eric, you mentioned phishing earlier, but switching gears is, you know, the, the new technology that are coming in, like AI and um, those technologies, as as they can be leveraged to improve care, they could be leveraged into, um, you know, making sure that they're used to do uh, scalable attacks, that phishing attacks that cannot be traced back to humans. So that's something that I think as an industry need, needs to tackle what, what can be done. Um, I think you mentioned, uh, Eric, the geopolitical uh, rans ransomware and what, what can be done on that stage so that new technology are not being leveraged to, um, to forbid actors. Great, three three really good answers there. Thank you. Okay, um, what's the one thing that made a difference to cybersecurity, either at your current organization or previous one, that you wish you had learned sooner? You know, I start with that. Um, so I don't know if I say I wish to learn sooner. I was fortunate enough that I had um, a good. Uh, a good, really uh, a good boss and uh, executive leadership is very executive sponsorship for cybersecurity is very important, particularly as you're attacking the medical device problem and the fact that the medical device security uh, and building the robust security program. And you make sure that you're, you know, either you partner through internal audit to bring visibility, but that it needs to be a sponsorship from executive level that to build in, to bake in cybersecurity into every process, into the procurement process, into the life cycle to make sure that the, that the, um, that the patches are applied whenever the medical device manufacturer validated them. So I think I'll say that executive sponsorship and also being the business partner and make sure they're building those relationship with, you know, these different groups, um, and, um, tailoring the training and, and it's really about um, making sure that you put your hat, your business hat on and be part of those, uh, learn about the healthcare technology trend, learn about your procurement process, learn about your, so that you can talk to uh, clinicians intelligently and comes to the time that you say you want to make a decision based on cybersecurity, then you have, uh, you can speak their language as well. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And Eric? Yeah, so I'll, I'll say, you know, a long time ago, an old uh, CIO boss of mine sort of, uh, <laughs> he gave me some great advice in, in a book that I read, which I, which sort of like pivoted and, and, and changed my direction on, on how I approach cyber. Uh, the book was called The Goal, Theory of Constraints. If, if you haven't, um, seen or read that book, I would highly recommend that you pick it up. It's a super easy read. Um, it's a Socratic method sort of thing. It's about a fictitious uh, manufacturing plant that needs to do a turnaround. And the, am I still here? Sorry. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Everybody got so still. I just worried that my you had us captured. You had us. You had us right where you wanted us. I worried that I, that I my my internet went out. Um, so the the uh, the whole idea on this is about continual improvement and measuring and uh, and how you can incorporate that into your various programs. And so, I, you know, I took that book to heart, um, and then I you know ultimately eventually got introduced to Lean. Uh, the lean management process, uh, which I think is just a, such a fantastic me methodology to use. None of this is cyber, by the way. This is all about, yeah. you know, organizational um, excellence and, and 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 improvement. So, you know, my takeaway from all of this is you got to approach cyber as um, as a continual improvement, ever evolving program. You know, risk hygiene, all these things that we talk about are the science and the art of of what we do. But at the end of the day, we've got to constantly be improving, constantly be finding those opportunities, constantly, you know, routing defect out of the out of the process and measuring and improving value through metrics and measurements. And so I think that's always been sort of my makeup. It's who I am as a leader. You know, when I think about, you know, approaching the problems and, and I it's so valuable to, to tackling issues. Fantastic. And, and I'll just sneak one in here for Rob Suarez. He's. He's drilled into us that cybersecurity is a journey, not a destination. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Probably heard that one before. <laughs> Will? Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of mention this before, but I'll, I'll say it again and kind of, and, you know, and it, it is, this is controversial with a lot of healthcare organizations and even within my own is that, you know, that looking at med dev medical devices as IT's responsibility. Um, I think that, um, you know, we have we've not we have not done that in the past, and I wish we had done it sooner, um, because you know, expecting a different you know, expecting biomed or facilities or some of our operations to manage these or to follow IT process processes or cybersecurity processes, I think over the years has been, in, at least in my my experience, has been kind of a fool's errand, and it just wasn't sure. it wasn't ever happening. It wasn't going to happen the way we wanted it to, and. Like I mentioned earlier, we just the last year or so just took it over, and it's it's been going a lot better for us. And going forward, we're gonna we're gonna keep taking more of it over and bringing those more into IT. Um, but like I said, it is a little bit controversial in a lot of health systems, but it, I think it's definitely something that we're seeing uh, huge improvements on. All right. Yeah. Great. And Scott, I'll just add to uh, what Will was mentioning earlier, the talent and the importance of looking outside the box for your cybersecurity talent. And a uh, prime example of that is you get someone with a medical device experience and you teach them cybersecurity. Uh, and I think it's just um, you want to find someone already or maybe you are able to get someone trained, but um, there is a need of having these clinical information security specialists or medical device security specialists who understand the clinical workflow, who can really uh, speak the clinician's language and who can learn cybersecurity. Um, so it's um, building the next uh, future talent for, for cybersecurity is going to be uh, paramount. Fantastic. Yeah, we find that talent um, in all different ways. Right? I, I know coming up yeah. through our organization, we've had folks with journalism backgrounds and all kinds of different backgrounds, they turn out to be fantastic communicators. And once they learn the technology, they, they are the best at it and, and they continue to uh, elevate their careers. So yeah, I, I encourage um, everyone not to, not to look past it because it's a fantastic field. Um, we do have some questions. Uh, if we have a little bit of time left here, uh, the questions did roll in here. What, uh, here's one for you. What are the main standards in cybersecurity you are following in your organization? Um, oh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, so we, we uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework is a, is a fantastic framework to leverage and there's lots of you know, other NIST special applications to consider. Um, I would definitely highly take a look at that as well as some of the the federal information processing FIPS uh, documents. I think those the, they they do a great job of sort of enumerating um, some of the depth of cyber. Uh, I will also say HICAP, Health Industry Cybersecurity Practices. So this was just recently on January fifth. I guess it's not that recent anymore. Uh, it, it amends. Uh, it was added into law as a recognized cybersecurity practice and amends 
HIPAA and HITECH, specifically HITECH. And it instructs OCR, the Office for Civil Rights, to take into consideration if an organization has implemented recognized cybersecurity practices. So if you've adopted NIST, if you've adopted HICCUP, and you do that over the last 12 months, and you hit and you get a, you are breached, they have to consider that as they're looking at uh, civil monetary penalty, oversight, and resolution agreements. So uh, lots of excellent material in there. Uh, if you just Google HICP, HHS, you'll find it, you know, on the first page. Great. Uh, uh, well, yeah, we, we, we follow NIST. Uh, we also, we also do pick up and, and follow some high trust um, um, policies and um, guidelines, but we, we are not high trust certified. <clears throat> okay. Uh, uh, no, anything else to add? Um, yeah, I mean, from us, we for, for, for the framework, we have published our cybersecurity framework uh, with the Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council for any medical device manufacturers who wants to, you know, to build uh, secure security into their development lifecycle. So I encourage you to take a look at that if you are from the MDM side. Yeah, and 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 then if you're multinational, you're looking at the ISO 27001 and those those as well. Um, so there, I, I thought this was an interesting question and it may have already been answered, but um, let me just, uh, uh, are you as a healthcare provider actually recording and managing the complete system and software configurations of many to most of your devices, like complete asset and configuration management, same as you would for your IT OT systems. And does the disclosure by the supplier of the configuration and SBOM help you with that? Yes um, and yes. Yeah, yes and yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it said that it, the question actually says, I, but I think Eric just answered this. So did you want to add anything more? Um, you know, other than I'll say like everything, it is, uh, it's continual operational management and improvement, you know? So you've got to, having these systems, the CMBBs, the CMMSs, uh, you know, all those tools in place, it's not just about installing the tool, that's the easy part. It's, it's about maintaining it and really, it's really a challenge and, and it, you got to bake that into the culture of IT and, and uh, medical technology management uh, practices. Yeah. I think Eric said it best earlier when it comes managing the metrics. You know, our IT our IT management systems aren't perfect. We're constantly managing those. Like, and so our medical device systems, we we use um, a tool called Medigate, and so we are constantly working to improve that, just like we are with our with our traditional legacy IT systems as well, too. So um, it's just something, and we we're reporting on those metrics and always constantly get getting better at it. Okay, great. And L, do you want to add anything there? So it's, I mean, it's covered. So it's making sure that you also uh, not only rely on, on the tools to that, that to get the data of the software version of, to, to capture that on an ongoing basis as well and have it documented in your inventory. Uh, knowing what you have is very important and uh, trust but verify also the information that you get from these, uh, from, from the tools that you, that you have as well. Great. Well, we're going to end it there. Trust but verify. I, I like that. Um, thank you for your time, uh, panelists. It was a great uh, discussion. Really appreciate your, your insights. And we hope this was beneficial for everybody. Um, and with that, uh, we'll go ahead and end the session. Thanks, Thanks everybody.